Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, They shall not enter my rest. All right. I am, uh, I've encouraged you to join us throughout this series. What God is doing in your life is a process, and uh, it's not a one-and-done thing on a Sunday morning. Typically, I would give you the freedom to do what you want with church, to come and go, but this is a series in Hebrews that seems to be building upon itself and revealing the work that God is doing you in your life in stages. We're going to look at several things this morning. We'll do a little bit of a review. We'll also look at a couple Greek words that um, we can see the difference barely in our English, but it really, a lot of things pivot on these uh, Greek words. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about those in your life that you love, you care about, but in your eyes, you can see that they're drifting away from God. I have a plaque in my house, um, it's, it's a Psalms, uh, a verse from the Psalms, be still and know that I am God. And it's a, it's a plaque, it it's, sits in a room, I guess I call it the seating room because there's no TV there and the only thing to do in this room is to sit. Um, and I'll, I'll see this plaque from across my house, typically walking in from after doing some tractor work or, or bush hogging and just overwhelmed with whatever it is. Maybe it's the rain this week or something or, or whatever's going on in life. And I see this, this sign in my house, and it's a constant reminder to me to be still in my moment and to know, to know who's God to know that there's, there's nothing that I can do that can circumvent God's power and control in my life. And it seems to be an underlying theme here at Midtown, what is being preached to you through the gospel of our Lord and what has been preserved in the Bible over thousands of years to trust in the Lord, your creator and your maker. So Proverbs 17, my wife brought... Uh, read this to me this morning. It was a verse that popped up, I think, in her morning devotional. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. You see, the thing about a joyful heart is that tends to overflow, that tends to be evident to those around you. But those who are crushed in spirit, it's a lot easier to pull back and to hide that. Right, you just kind of blend into the background of life and you're quietly wasting away. Your bones are, are drying up and you desperately long for someone to step into your life and to breathe life back into you. Ironically, it's kind of a uh, catch-22 because the more you are crushed in spirit, the more you, be, you can become reserved and the more you pull yourself away from people, the more we don't know what's going on in your life in order to know how to minister to you. But I'll let you know this morning, if you are the one who's crushed in spirit and you just don't want to talk about it or don't, you, don't, you don't even know how to talk about it, you're okay. You're okay. This message is for you. 
for those sitting around you to identify people like you this morning. And hopefully this message is also to help protect you if you have a joyful heart, to keep that joyful heart moving and going. And what is it that's behind the joy in the heart? We're going to jump in uh, Hebrews 4.11. This is the driving verse of where we've been going as we've been looking at Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4. Verse 11 is that this is the verse we've been setting our, our sights on. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. And now we begin to describe the rest that we are entering. We will touch on it today. We will dive in, in it next week. But you have to strive, you have to work in order to enter this rest, this rest that belongs to God, so that none of you, so that you may not fall by the same sort of disobedience. So this is the verse we are pushing towards, one verse at a time. Um, Hebrews 4, verse 1, we pick up today, right? Let's just jump right into it. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest, whose rest? God's rest. Therefore, while the promise of entering God's rest still stands, still stands for you today, right now, those of you who are crushed in spirit, there is a rest that is waiting for you to enter. This rest is open for you right now. It still stands. Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Let me read that verse again. Therefore, while the promise of entering God's rest still stands for you today, let us fear, watch the pronouns, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So I fired up a few commentaries this week and, I, and, and a couple sermons. I wanted to hear how this verse was approached because my gut reaction to this verse, when I read it, 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 something didn't seem right. First off, God told me I don't have a spirit of fear in 1 Timothy. God told me in John, 1 John 4 that perfect love casts out fear. But now he's telling me I ought to fear. And then when I read it the first time, just kind of skipping over the surface, I feel as if he's telling me I should fear lest I, lest I fail to reach the rest of God. I should, I should fear as if this is a as if this is a way of protecting me or a, a fence that is, is put around me in order to keep me in the rest of God. But I read it multiple times and I started seeing a new picture come out. And in most of these commentaries and preachers I was reading, they, they, they put this forth, and I let you know this so you can decide for yourself. They put this forth. In other words, let me read it to you the way I originally saw it and the way I heard many sermons on it this week. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of us should seem to have failed to reach it. But what he's saying is, you should fear lest someone around you fails to reach this rest. Let us fear, let us, who's the us? Those who have entered the rest, lest any of you See, the, the author of Hebrews is not including himself in the second part. He's reached the rest. And now he's telling himself, I need to be in a state of fear lest anyone in my surroundings and the family of God has failed to reach it. And so I opened up the, the Greek. I want to make sure that I was seeing this right even in the Greek. And it, it was the same thing in the Greek. The pronouns are there. The, the writer of Hebrews is saying, those who are in the rest of God should have a, 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 a heart, a mindset of fear in, or, in, in case those in their circles that are also in the family of God have not reached that rest yet. That's, that, that held me up all week. It just didn't seem to fit. It didn't seem to make sense. And I, I just, all week long, God, why do I fear if you haven't reached the rest of God? And this rest of God is not, is not your Christian status in the family of God. This is a rest that stands today. This is a rest that is right now, that you are a believer, you are a, a child of God, and you haven't entered into the rest of God. I should be fearful for you in case you've missed it. 
And if you've entered into the rest of God, there should be a, a element of fear in you for those around you in case they seem to have missed it. I want to put this in a, in a illustrative way because it begins to make sense as you go back into Hebrews and ask Hebrews what he's talking about. And by the end of this, I, I hope and I pray, this is my prayer almost every week, that uh, at the end of this, that you are encouraged, one, to trust God more, and two, to encourage others to trust God more. That's, that's my hope at the end of this. Seems very simple, but it's uh, very interesting what's going on. You, you know, it's just a modern day phenomenon that's happening. People are falling off cliffs because they're taking selfies. I mean, have you heard of any of those stories? Somebody takes a selfie, they're standing on the edge of a cliff, and for somehow, some reason, they're taking that selfie and they fall. They misstep or whatever, and they fall. And, and it just, my gut reaction is to that is, are you, are you stupid? You fall off a cliff, you die. But it seems like there's more, a, a more a, the appeal is greater the higher the cliff and the bigger the danger that these people are being lured out to these, the, the very tip, the edge of the cliff in order to capture a selfie. Now, what's going on? They're being deceived by a, well, what, what, where's that selfie going to end up? On a social media platform. And what is the ultimate hope in most, if not all these people? That they get recognition. And what is that recognition doing? It's, it's fueling validation. It's fueling something within this person. This person who has dr driven himself to the edge of a cliff to take a selfie and hopes to get the most likes is searching to be loved, to be valued. So you're, okay, let's just put it like this. You're a friend of this person and you see the sign, hey, don't go beyond this point. And you see your friend say, well, let's go. Let's go, get a, let's go get a picture at the edge of the cliff. And you're, you're, you're sane, and you're thinking, and you say, no, you know, it's, it's too dangerous. I'm not going to go. But your friend's determined to go. What happens in you? Well, there's a side of you that fears for your friend. I mean, things will probably be okay, right? The chances of falling are very limited. But there's a chance, and you become concerned for your friend. How do you get your friend back to the safe side? This is, see, this is what Hebrews is starting to bring up. Less, we should fear lest any of you seem to have failed to reach it. That something has lured you out of, I'm using James's words, uh, the, the book of James, lured you out of the shelter of God, which is your own flesh, and has placed you in a realm of, of danger. Or what Hebrews is saying, in a, in a realm of, of busyness that doesn't, it doesn't bring rest. How do you get that person back to the, to the safe side? Hey! The sign says don't go beyond this point. Well, yeah. I mean, no duh. I mean, they read the sign. In fact, it was the sign that encouraged them to go to the edge of the cliff. There's got to be something cool beyond that sign. They don't want me to see it. Well, there's also other ways. And this is what I'm, I, I'm driving at today and every other Sunday before, is if you can understand why that person is doing what they are doing, you can begin to engage them at a much deeper level. Hey, you want a selfie? I, I know of a better place than that cliff. Come, come with me. Let, let's go take a selfie together over you engage the person at their emotional response, you're more likely to lure them back than just screaming at them. The sign says no. I mean, this is what Paul says about the law, that the law is, is there and it can actually tempt you to cross the line of the law. So this is what, I mean, it's a picture of what Hebrews is driving at. There's this fear in us that we know, we have family members, we have friends, we have those who are, are part of God's family that are failing to reach the rest of God? Do you fear for them? What gets me is why do I have to fear? You're part, you're, if you're part of the family of God, why do I need to fear for you? 
And I think it's just the reality of Proverbs 7. Is that there may be in this very room right now people who are crushed in spirit. That God doesn't care just about your afterlife experience. He cares about you right now. That the rest that he's in right now, he longs for you to be in this rest. So much so that his family is on high or should be on high alert for those who are failing to enter it. That today, right now, there is a rest in the Lord that, that would remove all of your crushed spirit and replace it with joy. You know, those who are crushed in spirit, you know what they do? They turn to things in order to alleviate the pain. And oftentimes, these things put them in further bondage. Be it drugs or alcohol or a sexual sin or even suicide. But they're finding solutions on their own. But the Lord's love for them is so great that he doesn't want them to, to seek out any other answer other than himself. So for us, for those who have obtained and walked into that rest, there's this holy fear within us that looks out for our brothers and sisters. All right, so, but let me unpack this from Hebrews. Let me show you from Hebrews that this is what he's talking about. He, we, we go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. What have you heard? You've heard about the goodness of God. You've heard about how God is the creator of the world. He creates you. He sustains you. He's provided for your salvation. You've heard of how good he is to you. You've heard it through the, boss, God, the, through, through the gospel. You must pay much closer attention lest you drift away to that cliff to take that selfie because it seems good. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, church, today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. Do not harden your hearts. Do not become rebellious. Do not become stubborn in your heart, in your seat of emotions, where your emotions are aroused. Do not become stubborn. Open yourselves to the words of God, lest you drift away. Verse 12, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But encourage, exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Can you put on Hebrews 4, 1 again? And so what is he saying? So therefore, those of us who have obtained the rest, uh, it's like the third slide, Hebrews 4, uh, verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you have a hardened heart, lest any of you are drifting away, lest any of you are, are falling away from the living, living God. This is, this is what the author is getting at. Now, now back to, go to the Genesis slide. Now let's review. I mean, what, what is this rest? What are we doing? Genesis 2.15. I want to talk about your design. Some of this is review. So if you're jumping in today for the first time in the series, I might be a mindful, it might be a lot to, to swallow, but uh, I encourage you to go back to our webpage and the sermons are up there. We're still working on our last week's sermon. It'll get up there soon enough. The Lord God, Genesis 2, talk about what you're designed to do. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to what? Keep it, to protect it, to guard it. That Adam was created not to just till the ground, but to guard the life protect the life in that garden. Make sure that the life was sustained and, and, and guarded to keep the life. And then Adam fell to sin. One way or another, he fell and they were kicked out. And what, what happened? The Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to what? To work the ground. He could no longer keep the ground. He could only work the ground. 
But Adam was still designed in the image of God to keep, to protect life. And this hasn't left him, but he's, he's, lost to, he's lost the power to protect life, but not the instinct to protect life. And this is what we're busy doing, attempting to protect and preserve to find value for our own lives. Because that is our instinct, being created in the image of God. This is what we were ultimately designed to do, but we lost the power to do it because of sin. And so the person out taking a selfie on the cliff, I mean, what is he doing? He's trying to protect his value and keep his value, and he's doing it in ways that are fruitless and futile. And you know he is a valuable person. He just doesn't know it. He's searching through a digital means and you're calling him back. But yet the way to actually bring him back from the ledge is to instill real value into him. And you're thinking to yourself, man, did he see my selfie on Facebook by that cliff? No, I did not. This was just a random thought that came in my, my, my mind this morning, but... Oh, and then Genesis 4, 9, what happens? And then the Lord said to Cain, hey, where's, your, where, where's Abel, your brother? And Cain, what did he, well, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Cain, this is your design. That word keeper, by the way, back in Genesis, Adam was designed to work and keep. That word keeper, the same Hebrew word. Cain knows there's a part of him that is obligated to his brother, to protect and keep his brother. Yeah, it's, the God, it's God who's sustaining his life. But what does Cain do? In the search for his significance, he kills his brother. And in doing so, he acknowledges that there's a part of him that should have kept his brother's life. What am I? My brother's keeper? Well, the rhetorical question, the answer is yes. Cain, yes, you are. You were designed like me to love one another, to watch out for one another. If someone asks you for your cloak, give them all your clothes. Yes. I got a feeling many people answer that question as no. And then, you, then we justify why we don't watch out for one another and help keep each other. But you see, if you answer this question as, hey, hey, are you your brother's keeper, your sister's keeper? No, that, that's their responsibility. Well, they, you haven't, you haven't entered God's rest yet because you are. God uses you to protect the lives of one another. Therefore, while the promise of entering Hebrews 4.1, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed, have failed to reach it. I fear if, if I'm your keeper, if you're my keeper and I'm perceiving in your life, I'm seeing that you're, you're, you're failing, you're not resting in God's rest. What do I do to engage you, to help you obtain this rest? Or I could just say, well, that's your problem. That's not mine. And that's not the approach that God wants his family to take. Verse 2, for good news came to us. You know, these pronouns reveal how, you know, what he's saying here. For, for good news came to us just as to them, those who did not reach the rest, but the message they heard did not benefit them. The message they heard, so they heard the same message as you and me, these people who have not entered the rest, it did not benefit them because they were not what united by faith with those who listened. That word faith, we're going to come back to it because this is where we need to start splitting hairs and, and definitions. They were not united by faith to those who listened, to those who came into the rest. And there's another tragedy happening in our world today, and I have no political opinion on it in front of you. I have political opinions, but these mass shootings, right? I mean, it just, it stirs up a lot of topic of how do you control mass shootings? Well, but one thing schools are starting to do is they're starting to have mass shooting um, drills. What, what do you do when an intruder comes on the campus with a gun? 
And, uh, and they're trying to make them as, as frequent as fire drills. And um, so that there's an instinct reaction when someone comes on campus uh, with a gun. Imagine if you're, uh, you've got some elementary age kids, and you hear that these teachers and these staff and the, the leaders of your school, of their, your kid's school, is going to have a meeting where they're going to train these leaders on how to respond during a mass shooting. Part of you said, well, good, I'm glad my school's taking initiative. I want to go sit in and watch and hear what's being heard. So they bring in a, a guy from an outside source, and all the teachers, cafeteria workers, janitors, principal, vice principal, I, I mean, everybody is there. And you're watching as a parent. You just want to know, are they absorbing in the info? Is this going to be effective or not? How much do they care about my kids? And the guy starts talking, and he's very boring and mundane and monotone and he's just powerpoint after powerpoint after powerpoint and you're you 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 fight boredom sitting there but you're intrigued you want to listen and you want to soak in and you're also watching everyone and you realize you see the janitor poking the school nurse in the hair and you see um you know you see the first grade teachers giggling and talking back and forth and what do you think? I mean, become a bit fearful. What they're hearing isn't benefiting them. What they're hearing isn't benefiting them because there is a lack of conviction amongst this group that is telling uh, they probably think, ah, this is never going to happen here. There's something within them that is telling them, this isn't going to happen. This is not important. I can giggle with my first grade teachers or, 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 or whatever. I don't have to pay attention. What, do you, what happens to you as a parent? You become fearful because what, what they're hearing isn't benefiting them and it's not benefiting you or your child because they are not united together in this mission. For good news came to us just as it did to them, but the message they heard was the same message we heard. It did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. What did they listen to? Well, you go back into Exodus where, where this part of Hebrews is coming out of. They listened to the greatness of God. They listened to how God rescued them from slavery. They, they, they listened to how, to how God walked their, their forefathers out of slavery across the Red Sea for their benefit. They listened to the majesty and the glory of God exposed in Macon. They listened to how God was amongst them, how God lived in a tent and a tabernacle, and eventually a temple was built for him. They listened to how God led Joshua to lead the, the Israelites, a bunch of nomads, into a promised land, across a river into a promised land, and how God defeated their giants. And yet what they wanted to do was remain in the desert and fight their own giants and lose to them. They, they listened to how God delivered them from their troubles and their problems. They listened to what's taken place in the past. And what, 12 of them, 12 of them was sent into the promised land to scope it out. Two came back and said, we got this because God's on our side. And the other 10 said, nah, let's stay in the desert and let's fight like hunger and thirst, and, and maybe God will take care of us. It's going to be much better than going in there fighting the giants. It didn't benefit them. Everything Moses handed down did not benefit them. They were not united. They were not united by faith. That word faith... Well, I'll hold off on that. The, the definition of the word faith is critical. They heard the works of God in their life. And you've heard it too. 2,000 years ago, God, your father, sent his one and only son to hang on a cross and to bleed out and to die for your sins. Who conquered death, who, who defeated death, who rose from the grave so that you would know love you would have forgiveness of your sins, that you would be united to the Father, not through anything you can do, will do, any fights that you will finish, but because of God's love and his gracious hand upon your life. You've all heard it. You just heard it again. 
And what Hebrews says, look, if you hear that, don't harden your hearts to it. Do not become stubborn. Don't go back to the desert to fight your giants. You're going to become crushed in fear. Hebrews 4, verse 3, we, for we who have believed entered that rest. So, I need to bounce between these two slides for a moment. So, pardon me, they're not back to back, but I want you to see this word believed. For we who have believed entered that rest. And now, let me just go back and uh, let me find it, let me find it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going forward. For good news came to us. I just I want you to see this. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them. Why? Because they were not united by faith. Okay, that word faith, all right, that's that's a little a little different. They they were not people maybe sitting in this room are not united to this family because they're not united by faith. We who have believed entered that rest. Those two words, faith and belief, they're different. They're very, very, very similar in the Greek. So close. But the word faith means to be convicted of something. And I've laid out the argument that you, you cannot change your convictions in and of your own power. You have to hear something, you need to listen to something, and then you need to trust in what you are hearing. But ultimately, the faith of salvation comes from God. He puts a conviction within you that begins to grow. So there may be some amongst us this morning who, who are not convinced of what they have heard. You have heard about the goodness of God. You have heard about the Father sending His Son. You have heard about the resurrection. You have heard about the forgiveness of your sins, and you are not convinced of it. You are still working for your own salvation. You have not believed and entered into this rest. This rest we are talking about is not an eternal rest. We are talking about a rest here and now today. We are not talking about your salvation and your place in God's family. We are talking about you living in the newness of your, of your new life that God has given you. So you have not become convinced deep within your heart that God is God. This word believe means to act upon your conviction. It is a trust that acts upon what you know is true. We who have believed have walked into this rest. And you know it if you believe. You know the rest Hebrews is talking about if you're believing. If you do not believe, you're going to have a hard time figuring this out mentally. You have to experience it. When you trust in God with all of your heart, there is not a problem in this world that will remove you from the rest, from the peace of God. There's not a problem in this world that will crush your spirit. You've probably seen the people, the children of the Lord in wheelchairs are, are on their deathbed due to cancer, and there's just a joy about them. You've seen people who are pressed from every side, and they just, they don't move. They're tr they, because through their belief, they have walked into the rest of God. Satan has lost all power upon their life. But there are those who are, are still not convinced that taking the selfie by the cliff is dangerous. That's not the way to go to find value. So the question begins to arise, so what do we do? with this fear and this concern that we have for the family of God who are not fully convinced and are not living in their belief or, or belief in God. 
Verse 3 goes on to say, as I swore in my wrath, God says, they shall not enter my rest. And they didn't. Joshua led a new generation into the promised land. The rest of them chose to die in a desert. They chose not to believe what they, what they heard. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, now we begin to talk a little bit more about the rest. God, he's done working from the foundations of the world. From the moment he laid out the world, the, the work was sealed up, it was done. Because he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter that rest. So this is the rest we are entering a rest that God is currently in. Go verse 6 and verse 7, and then we'll wrap it up. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, that this morning you can enter into the rest that God is currently in and some of your family here are living in. It remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news, they received the good news, they failed to enter because of disobedience. Today, today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your heart. There is a world of temptation that is just waiting for you right outside that door. It's a world that is led by the, the allurement of social media, fake value, fake love, people who will never give you the shirt off their back, but they will like every picture you put on. There is a world out there that is, that is longing to steal every ounce of faith in, or every ounce of belief you have in God. And they don't even know what they're doing. It's a world of darkness. It is a world that is led by lies and deceit. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterward, and the words already quoted, do not harden your heart. So what do you do? There should be a God fear in you for those you love. That they are walking and living in, the, in their trust and their belief in God. And if they're not, what do you do? Nothing is not the answer. But if you're in the rest of God, nothing will not be the answer because you will be moved to do something. What do you do? Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another every day. As long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So what do you do? Then, and I don't have time to go into this, from James, the book of James, sin is your own flesh luring you out of the hiding place of God. Sin is a representation, a fake representation of God and fake conclusions to your problems in this world. Sin is the world in which your flesh lives and currently lives even today. Sin is the realm of not knowing what is true, but getting ever so close to trying to figure it out. Sin is led by little driblets of truth enveloped around lies and deceit and darkness. The deceitfulness of sin is so powerful, you will not even know it grabs you until it's too late. This is why the family of God should be concerned for you. And you should be concerned for the family of God. The power of sin to pull you out of the resting place of God is beyond comprehension. But the answer to that power is so simple, but yet you have to strive 
to get there. Proverbs 17, 22 shows you a very, two very different worlds. A joyful heart is good medicine. Not just for yourself, but for those who are in your life. It is the very thing that people begin to ask, why are you so joyful even though you're suffering? Why are you so joyful even though you are ill? Why are you so joyful even though a joyful heart is good medicine? But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Two different worlds, two different people. One being led into a resting place of God and the other being led by the deceitfulness of sin. And look, if you're too nervous or afraid to say, I'm that guy, I'm that gal who's being led away by the deceitfulness of sin, then what about this? Just say, I'm that person who's crushed in spirit. Well, the, the way you got there was being deceived by sin. Those who are living in the belief and trust in God. What does Paul say? I am perplexed, but not crushed. Persecuted, but not abandoned. But not destroyed. Wow. That's what I want for you. But the one who's crushed in spirit has been led to believe they've been defeated. It is the power of sin. I've got two, I call them sti oh, sticky note truths. You know, something you can write on a sticky note and stick it somewhere. Try to make them as simple as possible. But don't forget, we are striving towards this, not just for ourselves, but for one another. The answer to your problem is always trust in God. The answer to your problem will always be trust in God. He will lead you and he will guide your steps in the way you ought to go. The answer to your problem this morning, trust in God. You have heard of his goodness. You have heard of his works in your life you have heard, and I am exhorting you to act upon what you have heard. To begin to trust the Lord who has done all the good things in your life, who has preserved your life even to this very moment. Trust him. The convictions that God, God will do that work in you. You will be united to a family of believers through your conviction, God did do those things. God did bring me to this point. God did uphold me in my time of trial. God did bring me peace in the midst of my pain. God did that for me. The answer to your problem is always, always trusting God. And right next to that, I will encourage my friends, my loved ones, who also trust in God and their problems. But this may take on different forms. I mean, I, I don't know if I suggest, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest walking up to someone who pours out their heart, well, you got to trust in God, right? You can't take that picture by the cliff. That's dangerous. Well, yeah, the sign just said that. I mean, how are you going, how are you going to present the message? Well, look, look, look. The answer to that problem is what? Trust in God. He will give you the wisdom of Christ to see how to love your family or friend who is struggling, to call them off of the ledge through val value, validation, significance, through love, to a point to where you can exhort them. You need to trust in God. How do you exhort one another to trust in God? By trusting in God. I mean, it sounds simple, but Hebrews says we are striving towards this. 
So this morning, be still and know who's God. Be still and know who's God. My dad was texting me last night, ironically, and um, just come down with like a 24-hour cold. Just, just hit last night real hard. Throat started swelling up. And oftentimes I'll get cold, I'll get laryngitis. I just, I guess, always before church, lose my voice and whatnot. And my dad's texting me, hey, where's like two weeks ago sermon? You're kind of dropping the ball. I'm like, I'm thinking myself, dad. He's, pro- he's probably watching right now, listening. Dad can't deal with it. He doesn't know. Uh, you know, I'm just under the weather. And, um, and he texted me back. I said, I said, we'll get to it. And he texted me back. He said, you know, son, isn't it interesting that when you're in a moment of affliction and pain, time seems to slow down? Isn't it interesting that when you're struggling in life, you just want it to get over with, but yet the more you think about, I want this over with, the slower times, the tick. And he said, it's in these moments, Greg, that God is actually giving us every opportunity to slow down and be still, to trust in him. It's in these moments of affliction that time seems to actually be still, that God is giving us an opportunity to be still. In these moments, that we actually should be still and know who's God. God has so designed our imaginations and our way of thinking to actually slow us down. And I'm sitting here in the parking lot this morning and I uh, just want to sleep. And God's just saying, no, man, be still. Be still, it's going to be okay. And I'll tell you something, my throat doesn't hurt. I'm, I mean, I feel okay. And I, I believe it's because of what God has done in my life. The answer to your problems is always trust in God. Heavenly Father.